for listening to the BBC World Service. This is The World Today, and if you've just tuned in, our top story this hour, voters in the West African state of Ghana are choosing a new president. These elections are crucial for the people of Ghana. This election is vital to the future of Africa as a whole. for Africans to prove to the world that if given the chance, they can prove that they are capable of managing their own affairs. Do we want to go forward or do we want to go back? Do we want to move forward with lies? Ladies and gentlemen, December 7th, protect your ballot boxes the way you will protect and defend your Democracy should be about how to generate the wealth of society and how to distribute that wealth equitably. Growth is improving, social services are improving, the wealth of the country is increasing. One of the big issues in this election is the distribution of that wealth that is being created. A democracy is only as strong or as weak as the participants in the process choose to make it. It is rare to find in an African country after an election somebody not alleging that they have been cheated. My friend, we are not accepting the voter results. If you don't know what you are doing, it will endanger the whole country. Where are those figures coming from? And brother, if you have any other question, let's jo go ahead. Johnson, if you don't have anything, jo Johnson, you don't get here. where are those figures coming from? Madam, this is struggle for power. And people don't simply let power go. Freedom can sometimes come at a cost. Justice will come at a cost. Anytime there's a new regime, a conscious effort is made to smash members and supporters of the old regime. If we don't stop this cycle of vengeance, we will destroy our country and destroy it to the ashes. Are in the hands of God. We are likely to have a situation where the military, quote unquote, may take over the situation. A peaceful transition will be an example to the rest of Africa. So we are just so, so thrilled um, to yeah, make sure everybody's sitting in the right place. <laughs> are we all assembled? Perfect. Uh, just a quick round of introductions. Um, just to my right, I think this is my right, um, just to my right here, we have our director, Jareth Mertz. So in addition um, to directing and producing this film, um, Jareth has lived all over the world. Um, he is a, a Swiss-born um, actor, director, and producer, um, but he has spent time in Ghana and Germany and Switzerland and currently resides, I believe, in Los Angeles. Um, he, uh, in addition to creating films, he has also um, been featured in some of them, including uh, Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ, um, and also in ER. He is um, a, a, a renowned actor. Um, just to his right, we have Frank Agiekum. Have I pronounced that correctly? Um, Frank is from Ghana, 
and he is an activist and educator on the ground. We are just absolutely, really thrilled to welcome him. Um, he has been involved in, you know, environmental issues, fair trade issues, conservation, and I know he has a particular passion for working with the youth, um, sort of seeing them as the future uh, for elections and for democracy and for change on the ground in our countries. Um, in addition to the great work that he does in Ghana, he also was just instrumental in managing, you know, all of the local production unit in Ghana, and, you know, that involves, you know, arranging and fixing and, and all of that. Um, so we are just very pleased to have him here. And then, uh, just to Frank's right, we have two local folks. Um, we have Pete Moore, who is an associate professor of political science at Case Western Reserve University uh, in Cleveland. And he, he specializes in um, both, both Middle Eastern and African politics with a particular focus on state society relations, political economy, and political liberalization. Um, so he has also held positions in um, uh, the University of Miami and uh, Dartmouth College and Concordia University. So we're happy to have him here today. And then just to his right is Christine Henry, Christine Henry, who we'll call Chris Henry. Um, she is the vice chair of um, IPM, the International Partners and Mission. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, International Partners and Mission Executive Committee. Um, of the board of directors and their organization, um, they're based in Cleveland and they do work all over the world to really connect folks uh, on the ground in particular countries to folks from the United States who travel over. So, you know, whether it's working again in environmental issues or civil society development, it's really a program that believes in connecting people to people on the ground and, and strengthening our, our societies that way. So we are just thrilled to have her as a, a local representative here, um, but one who has traveled extensively internationally and has a particular experience in Kenya. So uh, without much more ado, Frank, I'm gonna start with you. Um, the question is, you know, just over two years later, you know, what is the mood on the ground? Have the hopes and the aspirations of the 2008 elections been fulfilled? Yeah, to a degree, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we have our mic? Mm -hmm. Can everyone hear? Ah, okay. Hello? Hello? Okay. Well, I'm, I'm dwelling more on the community-based development, mm -hmm. and I think what we really need is um, economic democracy involving chiefs and all be, being educated to be able to impart you know, and enforce a few educative programs on the ground identifying what the people actually need. Politics is politics. And the film explains everything. Since chills down my back, seeing it on the height, on the heights it is now. So I'm hoping for the best and for the youth to be able to understand. Thank you for that, Frank. And so it is the, the, the people working on the ground that are really outside of, you know, the sometimes theater of politics that are really making the change. Yeah. But you could see the rasmata in politics, mm -hmm. but the real thing is on the ground, mm -hmm. where people don't get what they really want. See, water and ed education, and that should come from the chiefs. Bureaucracy spends too much money, and money should actually go to the people. Thank you for that, Frank. And I think we're gonna have a, a number of more questions around that uh, when we open up uh, to questions from the audience. Um, moving on to you, Pete, um, obviously it mattered, this, the Ghana, Ghana's elections in 2008 mattered so much to the international community. Uh, how do you, Pete, feel that the international community has responded to this and, and, and did it get their rubber stamp in, in some ways and what have they done with that? Yeah, democracy should really be homegrown. No, that's, uh, it's good. No, it's good. <laughs> I think that about sums it up, doesn't it? <laughs> so I thought it was me. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. I, I think it does. I, I think that's a good point. The the idea is that the and the film does such a the documentary does such a great job of communicating very concisely the past, the difficult past, particularly regarding external intervention and the Cold War and 
And I think the international community actually has, has done a lot of negative in, in that part of Africa. And the, and the documentary also captures very well how, how uh, not very key the international role was, that this was really a domestic process, and that the international community was there, or the EU was primarily there just to give it a, a degree of, of legitimacy, um, in a sense. And, and this election was uh, very consequential, not just for Africa, but also, I think, for the events that we're seeing unfold in the Arab world, where um, the efforts to create founding elections is a very difficult process, but one where other models in the region are probably more, um, uh, uh, more apt than, say, models that come from Europe or North America. And then just one other thing I think that the, the documentary brought up very well, that it's a lesson for the international community. Um, and to move away from kind of a paternalistic view of African politics, which is this, which was the very nicely uh, put argument by that farmer who essentially said, you know, the question is democracy for what? And I think all too often as Americans, we look at democracy as elections and then everything stops. But I think we have a lot to learn from Africans who pose this critical question. If we have elections, but yet there's not social justice, there's not greater equity, there's not greater ability for Africans to be full participants in their society, then democracy really is a hollow concept. And I think that's something that uh, would be very useful for Americans to digest. Thanks for that. Uh, Chris, down at the end, moving to you. Uh, you were on the ground in Kenya during Kenya's elections. Um, and one of the points that the film brought forth was the importance of Ghana's elections as compared to elections um, that had happened and, and maybe been somewhat marred in Ken Kenya and Zimbabwe. Can you talk a little bit about you know, what the aftermath was like after Kenya's elections, which you were there for? Uh, what, what were the hopes and dreams of the people leading up to those elections and how did that shift in the aftermath of the elections in Kenya? Well, I, I was actually there before the elections. I was there in the, uh, the October before. Um, <clears throat> but I was there with an, an immersion group from uh, International Partners in Mission is, um, as was mentioned, a, a, a locally based organization and uh, an interfaith organization that um, works for social justice through um, partnerships in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, Central America, and Southeast Asia. And we take groups of American citizens to um, the to partner with the projects that are uh, home-based in these countries. And we were there, I was there as a part of an immersion trip um, to Kenya um, and just prior to the, the Kenyan election. So, and, and there was great excitement and great anticipation and great energy around, um, around politicking and around campaigning. And um, I know that uh, when we came home and after the election then um, occurred and things fell apart, uh, it was devastating to uh, the Kenyan people, to the partners that we worked with, um, businesses, women's businesses that we had helped to establish fell apart. People became homeless um, that we had long been supporting. Um, we had uh, a, a young man who had become a councilman in uh, uh, Nairobi had was killed. Um, and so just the IPM community followed very closely all of this activity through our director who is, um, our executive director who is married to a Kenyan woman and is very passionate and um, uh, got very, it was, it became very emotional and very personal for the whole IPM community to follow this. So. Um, it's, uh, uh, it, I suppose there's some good in that it set an example of what Ghanaians did not, did not want and would try to avoid, uh, but it was a very difficult situation. Thanks for that, Chris. We're going to open it up to audience questions in just a minute. Um, but, Jareth, I do want to just a quick, have a quick question for you about access. I mean, obviously you began filming this this movie before you knew the outcome and it really it's it's amazing you know oftentimes you know the election commission won't allow access into certain areas and I, I wanted you to talk a little bit about the process of, of getting such footage throughout the documentary <coughs> did that become increasingly difficult increasingly easier what was your what was your sense on that? Well, now I can finally spill the beans. It was all scripted. <laughs> <laughs> the dirty secret in documentary <laughs> filmmaking. Um, what happens in America? No, uh, what happens is that our family has had 
and um, you know cultural um, ties. My grandmother is is Ashanti, and my grandfather went to Ghana very early. So you know it's part of my culture, part of my heritage, and and our family has always been involved in po politics, um, not on one side or the other, but in in the generations and and the future of Ghana, basically, in in the building up of of a nation and the uh, identity. Um, so people knew of us. Nonetheless, what you have to do is you have to be there because people need to build trust, like anywhere. Um, and one of the crucial things that I found is that the longer we were there, the people, you know, even they, they didn't understand what we were doing, really, they accepted us. Now, a lot of the other correspondents came in like two weeks prior and, and you know, couldn't discern who belongs to which party. They, you know, they, they, they talk about similar things. And, and that was key for us, to do our homework, really do our homework, go in there. Um, and that's how we then had access, just, you know, we were persistent. And, and we prove to them that we're not there to exploit, um, you know, another bad image of Africa. That we were there. If they were granting us, you know, access, then we would we would um, work to show that the elections were as transparent as can be within a volatile and fragile democratic, you know, third world country. Um, there's one episode, just briefly. The electoral commissioner is a hero in this film for me. I mean, what he has done, the calm, the composition he has. I think it's, it's, it's a role model for a lot of other African countries to have such a charismatic and strong character when it comes to, to having a referee. Um, we sat one late night together in his office drinking a beer um, after a long day. Um, and I said, Dr. Afarijan, I think it would be crucial for us to get access to that strong room. And he was like, I can't do that. You know, in the end, he said, look, I will grant you access, but you have to promise me that none Nothing, none of the footage is going to leak out of this room until after the elections. He reached his arm across the table. We shook hands. I said, I promise. And that was it. A gentleman's agreement. I mean, can you imagine that here in the States? <laughs> Where you, you, know, you run the risk of being sued and, and, and it's just not possible. So, you know, I, to me that reinstated that there is, there are values. You know, the, a word counts. Um, and, and that's something I took from this. Absolutely, and I, th I think it speaks to what you're all saying is that it is so essential um, to just build relationships of trust, and you do that by working in communities day in and day out, day out, and just you know being part of the fabric of society in, in critical and uh, meaningful ways. I'm going to open up uh, to questions here, um, and we have uh, two mics on either side, so raise your hand, and uh, we'll go ahead and take our first question. For the director, when watching this film with live audiences, what has surprised you the most as, as you're watching it in terms of their reactions? Good question. Um, that people have been inspired to question, in a positive way, their own system, you know, no matter where it was. It's like um, people have been inspired by the passion that Ghanaians showed for their system, for their, you know, for their power that they have, the influence uh, that they have, and the difference that they can make. And with um, some American audiences, you know, they've, people have come towards me and said like, oh my God, I just feel so ashamed that I take everything for granted that I'm given, you know, and I shouldn't, because it is, that's part of my, my freedom, you know, it's part of the charter to, to have an influence on my environment, you know, that, that dictates the, the future of, of, of my children. Um, so, I never expected that to happen, that people would take this Ghanaian model and say like, oh, it inspires me and reminds me of our model. So it seems it's, democracy is a universal system that speaks to all. The question is, and I think like what Pete was saying, what do we do with it? Do we just accept it as something that's part of our lives or, or do we actually ask crucial questions? And I think that's what Ghanaians are doing. They're asking the question, does democracy work? And Frank was just saying, well, it should possibly be homegrown, you know, and, and that's different for everyone. You know, what does homegrown mean? Um, but people have been inspired, and, and um, th um, that makes me very happy. And I would, I would say another thing is from both parties, we've all been in boarding schools. And if you can't tolerate somebody for five years on their a school, nothing can really happen. So there's a uh, inner feeling for each party, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. you know. And, it makes it even easier. Mm -hmm. And that made it easier for us to access certain places that we couldn't. It's interesting, just one thing. Frank has, this is the first time Frank is seeing the film. Yeah. Really? 
exactly. This is the yeah. very first time. I mean, he's been you like crucial. Did. You know, he, he was there. He lived through everything. And I, if I may, yes. just take over for a second. <laughs> Please. Oh my God, I'm such. <laughs> it's terrible. With I love this. Um, is like, how, how how is it for you? Like, because that's the question you asked in the very yes. beginning. Like, what has changed from what what you saw in the film? What is your reaction to? You've been there now. You've lived there. Time has passed, and what you're seeing. How is that? It just sends chills behind my back. Chills. Yeah, because I, I didn't believe I could see it in this perspective. You know, it feels so different, and that's why we have to work further on it, <laughs> especially to promote it to the youth and let them understand the efforts that went into it. Right. I feel so emotional about it now. And, and, and it matters, you know, and, you know, I think, as you were saying, the, the, the best part of, of the process is when you, when you feel that change mm. inside you. Yeah. Did you, when you were uh, working in, in the course of this film, do you have an example, Frank, of, of someone you met um, who you saw sort of transformed in any sort of inner emotional way as a result of this process? Do you have a story about that or an example? I need to sit down a bit and think That's more it. about okay. it. Okay, we'll come because, back to that. Because I know most of the people on it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was so tight. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so strange. Everything has gone this way. Yeah. But I know it should be a community-based mm -hmm. development. Mm -hmm. That's where the emphasis should be. Mm -hmm. Another question up here. Um, I wonder if Professor Moore or anyone on the panel could comment on why the election in Ghana seemed to work when, for instance, last uh, year, the people of uh, the Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire, voted and the opposition candidate was apparently elected, and yet the incumbent has yet to uh, relinquish power? Well, I, that's, that's a good question, and I think that part, uh, and, and, and this was mentioned before, democracy is not the same everywhere. Um, and also the, the the political distribution of power is, is much different. And I think the situation in Ghana was one in which you had two very dominant parties uh, that both, perhaps before the election, had already come to an agreement that losing didn't mean permanently losing. Uh, and this, this, I think, has to do with um, uh, the last 20 years in Ghana uh, has seen violence and, and seen this slow transition because these things take time. And I think the comparison with Cote d'Ivoire is um, that those, that political distribution of power is not as equal uh, among the elites. Um, and, and also um, uh, Cote d'Ivoire has not had the same experience in the past with uh, elections. And so one of the things is scholars look at is that countries that tend to have experience with, even if it's limited uh, elections or even fraudulent elections, the more times uh, countries and polities go back at that, uh, the better chance they have for eventually uh, having rather stable elections. But let's not Let's not forget, uh, violence in elections is, is rather common. Uh, India, which is you know one of the largest democracies in the world, commonly has uh, violence. Uh, and perhaps if, if more Americans voted, uh, probably the turnout in Ghana was probably over 80% of the electorate. Um, in, in our country, obviously, it's a vast minority <laughs> that vote. So I imagine if we had more people voting, uh, we'd treat it more seriously as well. I think we have another question. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> actually, it's kind of a two-part question. You just answered one of them. I was interested to find out what percentage of the uh, adult population was able to vote, and you answered that one vis-a-vis -vis what we get in the United States for 50 percent is considered a pretty good turnout. I was interested, uh, in the election, if the uh, voting happened to fall along ethnic lines based on uh, loyalties for the people with their, their backgrounds, and then... Also, if, uh, if any of the participants on the panel feel maybe if there's been any difference in the way democracy has either progressed or not progressed amongst the, the countries in Africa that were former British colonies opposed to, say, the Ivory Coast, which was a French colony and other French-speaking countries within Africa. Thank you. Do you want to? Okay. Uh, the French system actually is very different from the British. And our forefathers... Um, who fought for independence, actually did that by negotiations. And I was, like I was saying, people going to school under one roof, know each other, know their families, 
so so it's so difficult to also also say say anything because there was no weapons and the only weapons they used was strikes and dialogue sending petitions to authority to be able to understand their plight so i believe that was a factor in it am, am i okay well, the, the, the question perfect. also, like, if the election was, you know, uh, the electorate, did it go, you know, the divide, was it um, ethnically based, was it more, you know, ideologically, or how would you describe that within Ghana, how, you know, the voters went out to vote based on what, ideology, faith, eth ethnic background? Well, it was more faith, I should think, it was more of faith in being able to pass Pass a vote. Mm. I mean, to me, it was interesting to see. You see the uh, the images of people wearing those T-shirts. Um, mm. So you'd go to a rally. Um, you get to know people. They're wearing one T-shirt from one party. The next candidate came to the same place. You'd see the same people yeah. wearing <laughs> T-shirt of, of that. You know. So it sh it showed me that the electorate is very educated um, in this, and it's, it can't be fooled. And there's one thing that was being said when we tried to ask to interview people. Moses Imoro, you know, was one of the few, the farmer, who would actually state what he thought about politicians and politics. Um, and I think he made his point very clear. Others would say, like, the vote is in my heart. My vote is in my heart. So I'm not going to talk about that because at the times, you, you know, there's repercussions for saying or speaking your, your opinion openly. In the, the beginning of the film, we have this talk where they say you have to have a membership card, a party membership card. Um, so yes, you know, it, it, at times you, 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 you have your, your camps, your ideological base camps, but then you can undermine that as well. Um, and something in, you know, fascinating about Ghana is that people intermarry. The different ethnic groups intermarry, and that's something that Kwame Nkrumah, I think, encouraged in the mm -hmm. 60s. He outsourced, like, if you came from one region, let's say you're up from Alaska, you'll go and study in California, um, you know, or in, in Florida. Mm -hmm. So the whole country just gets mixed up, so you become one huge family. So if you go out and you think you're, you're killing your people, I mean, you know, you're, you're killing the opponent, what you're, you know, essentially doing is you're going after your own people. Um, and I think that's a great way in Ghana, it's, it's a political fail-safe in a way to have this, this mix. And then you were saying something about, you know, the borders that are drawn, um, post-colonial, yeah, you, know, you know, this is the border now, from this river to this river, no matter what ethnic group is there. Um, Ghana has managed, I don't know, how was it in Kenya? How, how, how is that, how, did, did, you, did you get the sense of how the, the, the voters the turnout was, was it more like ethnically based or was it? I, I think so. I think, I think it's more tribal in Kenya. Um, so that, yeah, there was still, uh, and, and even in the post-election situation was much more tribally focused as far as the, uh, the, the and the refusal, you know, to, to step back, uh, the two uh, uh, candidates. Well, that's an important so, point because there's a, there's a discussion going on. Should like African leaders, once their time is up, get a pension? Um, I think they should. Um, and there's a foundation um, that basically offers uh, politicians who relinquish power $5 million. I think $5 million is nothing compared to what you need to give someone who can reap benefits of $100 million. Uh, um, but, but it's a step towards a model that I think is very interesting so that people say like, okay, when I'm done, I will be fine, I will be safe. Um, I can let go of power. You know, my, my dignitary privileges uh, are not gonna be taken away from me. My dignity, I'm not gonna lose my face. Um, I don't know how you think about that, that Pete, the, the model of, of, of... Yeah, I mean, I think this is, this is, that, this is that idea that um, in, 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 in pluralistic democracies, losing now doesn't mean I lose permanently. I have a chance to win again in the future. Um, and the point you bring up is, 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 is quite appropriate for today. I mean, in North Africa and other parts of the Middle East, we're looking at popular uprisings against entrenched autocrats. And, and sort of the infelicitous way that this is resolved is actually letting these guys have a way out. Uh, the ruler of Yemen, Abdel Saleh, and Mubarak of Egypt, and these guys, if they don't think there's a way out, you know, forget a golden parachute, but, but 
they, if them and their families are going to pay, you know, the ultimate price, then they're going to fight to the death um, to, to not relinquish power. And I think this is something that each country has to adjudicate itself. But, but clearly, that's a very dangerous precedent. If leaders don't believe that they can, that they themselves and their families are not going to be taken care of. So I had never heard of this initiative. But, and you're right, $5 million is nothing uh, compared to what these guys can make in 20, 30 years but it's not so bad. Uh, you know, so. <laughs> For us, it's great. <laughs> Put it all in perspective, right? Um, we just have about, uh, we could spend three hours up here. Uh, we have just about eight minutes left, though. So uh, we'll take the next question. Um, did, has the NDC delivered on its promise from the election food, health, education? <laughs> They're trying. Like, you know, politics is politics. But they are admitting their failures in one way or the other. And that is appreciable. But the emphasis should be on community-based developments. People telling them what they need. And then you going quickly because just before I came, pregnant women couldn't go from one area to another because of bad roads. They kept on talking on the radio. Within two weeks, they have provided all that for them. So it's coming up, and a lot of investigative journalism is happening over there, which is being accepted by you know, communication, which is development. Mm -hmm. And if it's reaching the people, they, they, they have access to the net, they have mobile phones, so it's making it much, much easier. I think the next one will, might, will be better. Mm -hmm. Thinking about, again, campaign promises, you know, obviously they're the, the large level promises, but have any little steps been taken? I mean, have the, the seedlings been distributed that were promised in yeah, many places? Yeah, some of it. Mm -hmm. That is on the human side of it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's still that enmity between the parties. Mm -hmm. You know, that in at once, giving the boys jobs. Mm -hmm. And people are agitating that these people have too much money. And they're all building their campaign war chest for the so, next two years. So has the international airport in Tamale been built? <laughs> no, it's been refurbished to a state has, and of which now um, private planes can really land. And so it's, it's getting better. So I there's guess. small yeah. steps happening. Yeah. Well, I think it's very difficult in the, uh, you know, the aftermath of elections. I think we have to be very clear that elections cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And once you're done, because it's a fight, you know, tooth and nail, um, the coffers are sometimes empty. Like you come and you, you realize there is no money. Where are we going to start? You know, you start by borrowing money, um, and that's not a good start usually. Um, so how are you going to deliver on all those promises? I mean, the pressure, in my opinion, is so high. Um, and I was talking to Frank earlier. I said like it's the culture of filling potholes. You know, there's so many potholes. You you're just constantly filling up potholes that you can't even build roads properly. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a vicious circle that we have to try. In, in, in Ghana and, and in black Africa to get out of, um, you know, and there should be a fund for that. Are people happy that the elections went well? Yes, of course they are, but, you know, the, 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 the quality of life, the standard hasn't changed to the effect. Um, and that's one point I was making in the beginning. What happens in America doesn't stay in America. Um, America's a role model. If you like it or not, if we like it or not, it's a role model. People are looking here for a better future. And it's a huge responsibility, um, but it's also a great chance. You know, it's to, in, it's to influence people, it's to inspire them. And I think that's the future, is to inspire people. And that's what I was trying to do with, what we were trying to do with the film, is not hit you over the head, this is all bad, but no, there's a chance. We can learn from one another. You know, there is hope. Um, sorry. Next, uh, I think it has to be the last question, which we hate because this is such a great discussion. Please. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I was struck by the patience, um, the enthusiasm, the participation of the people of Ghana and how they had to wait so long to get the results. Like in America, it's like by midnight, we have it. Um, so I was wondering um, if you could talk to how the people in line, like were they eating? Were someone providing food? food and water, like it could have gone really bad because, you know, people when they're hungry, they get cranky, you know. And then also I wanted to ask about the um, Obama election happened the same year and how did that affect Ghana in their election process or, you know. I mean, it was inspiring. Obama's, you yeah. know, just the fact that uh, he was running for presidency um, was inspiring to Guineans and I think to the world. And I think what happened was that a lot of people who had lost faith and trust in America gained it. 
by that. You know, had he not won or won, just the fact that he was running for president, that the Americans were, were, were okay with that, um, just made the image of America, uh, how do you say, it was rehabilitated. It was amazing and it was inspiring to, to people. Um, and, and of course, politicians used the slogans, you saw them, you know, we need change, Obama. Um, but who cares if it's positive, you know, influence, um, the peaceful one, I think anything goes. To answer the other question, you know, people were hungry, of course, they didn't expect to be there for like the entire day. Um, but the authorities were doing best to hand out water. Um, you know, there's, there's, Ghana has like markets, people walking around with trays and everything. So um, people were taking care of one another. Because look, bottom line is people want it to work. They're tired of the conditions they've been living in for so long. They want it to work, you know? They, they want a change for the better. I have one last question, though, if I may. Um, and that's for Pete. It's like the importance of democracy for all of Africa, be it the Middle East, you know, be it Sub-Saharan Africa, um, you know, what we see in Libya, what we see in Yemen, what we see, uh, you were mentioning Syria coming up, uh, in Egypt. It's one great thing to create a platform for democracy. And it's one great thing to free a country. But what happens then? I mean, do you think this film can have an impact traveling through Africa? It's two parts of the question. What happens after these despots or, you know, dictators are gone? Um, and, and then could this film inspire people? <clears throat> and we must be quick about it because we only have yeah, about on one minute left. On the first question, I don't want to end up on a pessimistic note, but generally uh, uh, transitions as we're seeing them in the Middle East, uh, um, it, usually it takes a very long time. Uh, and the political speed is much faster than the economic mm. speed. And so people become, they demand in competitive elections the kinds of things we saw the farmer demanding in Ghana, and the economics can't keep up. So for a while there will be instability and it's difficult, and each country is, is different ultimately. But on a more positive note, I mean, I think for me personally, I, I look forward to using this film in my class because it does two wonderful things. It, it tells a very accurate, uh, um, very almost scholarly view of, of, of politics on the ground, kind of the bread and butter in, in democratic elections. But as you've said, it also, I think it'll get my students to think critically and comparatively about dem what democracy means here. Uh, and and I, I think that's extremely valuable. I mean, a film that can give you on the ground accuracy, but also get you to think about larger uh, issues in your own personal life is, is incredibly valuable. And I think that's a great point to wrap it up on because you know this film did matter if only to get us talking more. Um, and I just a big warm thank you to all of our panelists, particularly to Frank, um, who has traveled for Ghana, from Ghana uh, to be here with us today. And we'll wrap it up, but just, uh, you know, if you do want to get involved, again, I really encourage you to pick up this uh, Lights, Camera, and Action step locally. Um, contact the International Partners in Mission because they, they're really working to connect folks uh, across the world. Uh, the National Council for International Visitors, also um, a great resource. And the Cleveland Council on World Affairs. Um, please just tap into all of those organizations and get involved. And I want to thank you again for being here today. Have a great Saturday. Oh, don't, don't forget to vote for this film because it deserves the highest stars you could give it. Isn't that ironic? Huh? <laughs> don't forget.